It's a good win. There's a lot of people. It's like Woodstock, except everybody's got their clothes on. But eat a damn snack. You're like my wife when you get in space. You just get lost. Short steps are better than long steps. That's the only time in your life you're going to hit short is better than long. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to 614 Headsets, the weekly sports podcast where we say football is unconditional love. We're three high school football coaches from Columbus, Ohio. We consider our show a, a movement of this lifestyle, of this great game we love. We're excited to have you join us in this movement we're all about. Boys, say what's up to everybody. How we doing? Excited to get on here with the boys. The best day of the week right here. Appreciate everyone for tuning in and hope you enjoy this episode and many more. Okay, make sure you subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever your favorite platform is. Give us a like, give us a comment. Follow the show at 614headsets.com and check out the lab and all the fun X's and O's things that we're trying to bring you on there. And we appreciate everybody that is following us. And if it's your first time joining us, we hope you stay with us. All right, everybody enjoy the show. As we get rolling today, 614 Headsets is proud to be presented by Fundraising University Ohio offers a variety of fundraising efforts that helps football teams run profitable, effective, and fast-paced fundraisers designed to raise the most money in the shortest amount of time to reach their fundraising goals. Fundraising University Ohio is locally owned, operated, and with their six-step blitz system will help your team maximize profits. As a current coach himself, Brent Maxwell with Fundraising University will sit down and help you pick, plan, strategize, and execute your fundraiser that will allow you as a coach to focus on your practice time, prep time, player development, and personal time. If you're interested in us running a fundraiser for you, please contact Brent Maxwell at the letter B Maxwell at fundraising, the letter U dot net or 740-501-8946 to learn how you can get started with fundraising. Today, we got a great episode on today with Coach Manilak from Pittsburgh University. Coach Manilak is a, a special one for me, especially I was exa- I was super excited to get him on here just based off the fact that the time that he put in with me at Ohio Dominican um, and the things that we did and the memories that we made in that year, especially when we started 0-3 and, and then went and routed off the conference championship, getting smoked against Cal PA the first game. I think Coach Manilak was ready to kill all of us that night because we put, I think, what did we give up, like 52 points? And it didn't happen the rest of the year for my guy, though. But Coach Manilak comes to us with a lot of experience. Coach, were you at Pickerington Central or was it just Pickerington when you were there? So I was the first graduating class of Central. So as a senior class, we got to choose. So I was zoned to go north, but senior guys all decided to stay with Coach Sherrod at Central, and we started. So I, um, my younger sister, you're younger than me, actually went to north, drop her off every day, and then head over to Central. So finished it, finished where I started. Central was the original school. Yep, yep. So obviously he had, you guys had some money. Had the north side is the big money side of things. Uh, <laughs> first place, baby. Check me out. <laughs> Blue collar. Um, but other than that coach you can correct me if i'm wrong here you went you walked on at cincinnati university and then you went on to earn four letters and then signed with the buffalo bills after that you were at michigan state from 2011 to 15 valparaiso at 16 ohio dominican the panthers baby at 17 18 and then bucknell from 1920 and then now for you're at pitt to from 2021 till present if you want to talk a little bit about your journey and stuff, that'd be great. Yeah, I think that's certainly important. I got in coaching, I think, first and foremost, because of coaches like yourselves that had a tremendous impact on me. So 614 headsets, what you guys have going on is um, something dear and true to my heart because you're I'm a product of what you guys are, are doing right now, impacting young men in the area of Ohio. So it's special to me, which is a big reason. Again, I'm excited to join you guys and what you guys got going on here. Uh, But like you said, grew up in Pickerington, competed, had a chance to walk on Cincinnati and and huge opportunity there with Mark D'Antonio, who who is a tremendous mentor of mine. And and Coach Narduzzi was our defensive coordinator there. So obviously you can see where that relationship has turned into. But from there, had a chance to just compete and earn a scholarship. I went from a safety to a backer, ended up starting two years at linebacker. Like yourself there, Coach Sayers, just just an undersized overachiever. There's not too many 5'5 defense ends out there. 
We got it done, though. You, uh, <laughs> but we got it done. Like you said, won the GMAC championship, holding guys at 13 points a game. You're a little bit taller than 5'5". Five, five. What do you hit? I was about to say, I, I don't know. I think I've shrunk a little bit now in my time, too. I think I'm just under 5'9". I can't I'm wait for my question. Couch. I can't wait. <laughs> Full of heart, great energy every day. I love you. But like I said, play college ball, uh, overachieved, end up earning a scholarship and had a chance to go to the, the NFL as an undrafted free agent, you know, and bounced in, in and out of uh, active roster, but really a year's time, three head football coaches with the Buffalo Bills and, and two different uh, schemes. So it was really cool now being a coach, having been at that level and seeing the schemes we were using, part of a four down front, three down front and different coverages was something that certainly a big takeaway then obviously seeing the guys at that caliber at that level it was huge for me and, and uh, my development but then had a chance to go to michigan state going against relationships you guys talk about journey it's who the people you have a chance to impact or impress through your time and, and they give you something and you run with it coach d'antonio who gave me the opportunity to be a walk-on as the same guy that gave me an opportunity to be a graduate assistant coach at michigan state so I got a master's degree, but really got an education in college football in every facet, um, which which was tremendous and, and learned from a lot of great coaches up there at Michigan State, including Coach Narduzzi, who ended up launching his success into his head coaching opportunity. But had a chance as a young coach, went to Valpo for one year stint position coach and, and learned a different level of football, different way of operating, different resources, how to get things done, how to wear a few more hats because power five level, or power four level now. There's a lot of at, at the lower levels, you're doing pretty specific tasks. But when you, you go to a smaller program, you get to wear more hats, do a few more things. So it is an exciting experience. I'll give you a humbling situation. As linebacker coach, I carried a ladder out every practice for the end zone filming and had the, the injured players film and practice. I'll just to give you an idea of the different tasks coaches do along the way oh, as yeah. you're pushing footballs. It's different. You learn, uh, but it, it's Football is football. You love the guys that, that football draws to the game, the level of competitiveness they have and the passion. I think that's the same everywhere. Obviously, they get bigger, stronger, faster as you increase levels. That's fun, too. But then had a chance to go to high Dominican. Coach Cummings is a, is a great defense of mine. Awesome coach. He, he's been great for me and a great mentor. And I know he's had a big impact on you, Coach Sayers, at high Dominican as well. And gave me a chance to be a young coordinator. And, and really what he said is, hey, you could come in here and, and have an opportunity to, to screw this up and learn and, and grow. And, and we shared a lot of time together and hashed out a lot of things. And really, I came in and, and ran his defense. So I learned his defense from him and ran it, which was a huge opportunity to learn and grow and get to call plays. And like I said, had success two years there. We did really well and then got hired a chance to, uh, to go to Bucknell. So again, you talk about relationships again. Coach Cicchini at Bucknell was the same guy I worked for at uh, Valpo for one year, and he hired me when he had a coordinator opportunity when he got his next job. So I got a chance to go out there and, and had some fun with some smart young men out there at the FCS level. So, again, a different caliber, different type of athlete, different situation, different school, but still, again, that same type of kid is drawn to football is still there, which I love and appreciate and the same challenges and the, the level of competition. Once you get on the field, there's parity there in the league. So it, it was a great, another learning experience. And so I had a chance to be a coordinator two years there. And then coach Narduzzi had an opportunity here at Pittsburgh and, and jumped at the opportunity to come interview. And so the cool thing is I, I really do think I coach in, in one of the most enjoyable defenses. I played in this, our four, three attack quarters defense at Cincinnati for him. I was a GA in the system. So learned the ins and outs, even a year on offense and trying to attack it. And then went out and coordinated a different scheme and then had autonomy at Bucknell to coordinate what I wanted, which really a blend of what we do here and what I did at Ohio Dominican. And then coming back in this system um, and seeing the evolutions over time. But a lot of what we do, the meats and bones of what we do here at Pitt are the same things I was doing in 2004 Cincinnati, which is really cool. But the journey itself, like you talked about, it's about people, as you guys know, and, and having an opportunity and, and doing a, uh, doing the best thing you can with that opportunity. And again, I try to uh, surround myself with people smarter than me and just keep learning, take great ideas and run with it. And, and like I said, I'm fired up to be here. That's me and my journey. Well, Coach, we're excited to have you on. Um, you've seen some of this show, so you know what's coming next. We always started off with our pick six segment that was created by your very own Ryan Sayers way back when. 
powered by storied rival sports media. So we're going to give you six random questions. You don't really know what they're going to be about. It could be football related. It could be life related. But like I said, it's powered by storied rivals, media, championships, friendships, life lessons are among the most meaningful parts of athletic competition. Storied rivals is passionate about preserving them by offering the most unique highlight experience available. And Story Rivals delivers your team's content with services designed to change the way you experience these on for big moments now and for a lifetime. Story Rivals now offers a complete team apparel and player shop customizable to your program. Contact us by email at info at storyrivals.com to schedule an appointment with a member of our team. And I can't wait to get our stuff, man. I say it again. I'm still waiting. Aaron, send me my blackouts, man. I'm ready to get murdered out for 2024. So, Ryan, what you got for coach? What's your first question? Hey, first, I got to shout my two dudes up there taking the ad read. I don't have my IEP on here. I usually have text to speech, so I can't do those uh, ad reads Terrible. no more. You know what I mean? I'm, Thank I'm God he brought a great here. guest on today because hey. I don't know what he brings to the show sometimes. <laughs> right now, hey, Coach Bennett, like I already knew, he had to give me a video of stuff. I, I didn't read none of them, them reports. He had to uh, do text to speech for me. I was in my IEP, too. Coach Manilak, my first question comes to you from our coaching staff, my coaching staff this week. We've been arguing best players to ever play the game, and I thought, what a perfect one for you. Who's the best linebacker to ever play the game of football? Besides yourself. No, that's tough. <laughs> um, there's a lot of great linebackers. You, you got to throw Dick Buckus in there, old school, tough as nails, yeah. going back in time. And then as I was growing up, Ray Lewis was that guy. Patrick Willis was certainly a guy I studied the hell out of. When I was briefly in the league, as I talked about, one guy that I learned a lot from at that level, just his detail and discipline, was Paul Puzlozny, who was a Buckus Award Paul. winner in college. I had a chance to overlap with him a little bit and just really impressed with his detail and preparation. And obviously his performance, winning the Buckus and playing in the NFL for a long time. Luke Keekley's up there. The guy I was done just going to say, that's my, that's my guy right there. So there's a lot of them. And so it's hard to say the best, but again, I, I think from, again, the perception of football as I grew up, Ray Lewis is still that guy. It was that really was interesting. Argument. Everyone right. chose Ray Lewis on my staff. A lot of people chose Ray Lewis, but I said if Luke Keekley doesn't I like Luke. Luke. Luke's a great, Luke's a sneaky great choice it. too, man. I, I, mm -hmm. I started my first two years in, in college at Penn State in, in one of the very first visits I took, we went through the weight room and who's sitting there just curling iron, Paul Puzz Leslie, baby, right? right? Getting extra in at that point. <laughs> no. And it's just so interesting because like Paul and Sean Lee and all those guys that made linebacker you, they were the nicest people you could ever meet in your life outside the football field. And then on the football field, they had this switch where they just turned into pure animals like i'm gonna kill your mother on the game type <laughs> crap you know what i mean one minute you're shaking my mother's hand man and the next minute you're gonna kill her but i think paul got paul did not get the credit and the love in the nfl he should have got right you look at the tackles you look at the production he made in the nfl paul was like very undervalued or under awarded at, at the nfl level i feel and it was a, a funny paul puzzle story is we were we would run hills, right? We would do these build-up sprints where you would sprint across this soccer field and you'd sprint up this massive hill, right? And then you'd jog back around and your rest time was when you got back. Paul Puzzlezzi was the only person I've ever seen. He's doing burpees and extra during his rest time. And that, to me, just showed this dude's a Terminator. Like, he's not <laughs> even human, right? And so it was just, it was amazing to see everybody dying and breathing and trying to get their rest time. And here's this dude doing burpees and extra stuff during his rest time. It was just, it was amazing. Paul's a great guy, great teammate. Those are a couple of Paul stories from my time, man. I just I had to throw that in. No doubt. Coach, my first question for you. So you, I played football at Miami University. Five years you played at Cincinnati. What was the rivalry like during your time? What was the battery battle for the victory bell like? Got all the time? bells, the oldest rivalry west of Allegheny, as you know. Mm -hmm. Tremendous game. It was a, a big deal. Um, when we got there, Coach Narduzzi had just left Miami after a great year with Roethlisberger being a ranked team. He was the D coordinator, did a good job. And Coach D'Antonio just got hired at Cincinnati and stole him. So tightened the rivalry even more. Uh, but Coach D'Antonio, who had just left Ohio State, 
built some things similar in hindsight, thinking about this, built some things similar to what they did at Ohio State towards Michigan. Like we painted our helmets as scout team guys, white, and put the the logo on and, and try to make it personal. He gave us the bio of each guy we were to try to create that personality and, and who they were as players. I remember they showed us like visuals that the yeah, you guys at Miami would have signs of our logo in your urinals. They made it a big deal and made it personal, which was fun. But we got my redshirt freshman year, 2005, we went to Miami and I think Miami beat us that year. And I can just remember we had an alum there post game, just literally laying by the bell, knowing we had to give it away and tears going down his eye. And you could feel how powerful that was to, to a former Bearcat and, and I think after that, we held on to it after yeah, Cincinnati. It next year, time. yeah, after we got it back to 2006, Cincinnati held on to it for a good while. Yeah, until just this past year. It was a long time. And I think, too, though, like you think about it, you go back into a lot of history, like high schools and stuff. A lot of high schools used to have, like, trophy games and things like that. And then for some reason, they went away. Like, I know a couple still have them, but I think those need to come back or need to be reestablished. If you think about it, like, those are the things that make rivalry games and things so impactful. And like today's kids would latch on to that completely. I really think if you can dive back in your history as a program, if there's a rivalry game, you need to find a way to bring it back. Mm-hmm. Right. No, or you need to find a way to make a new one. And it, I, it, because it means so much, it's so impactful. It, it just adds that extra flavor into it. And I don't know why, but like, a couple of different high schools I've, I've worked for and I've, I've read through the histories. They used to be there and then they faded away. I don't know if some cheap bastard just decided not to like, hey, we don't want to redo the trophy. I don't know what it was, but I really hope those things make it back in high school at a lot of stuff. I agree. Now, I, I you just touch on our high school rivalry. We were at Pickerington, Reynoldsburg. Battle 256 was huge. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That's something that certainly I'll never forget. You know, going, I, going I was just, but back when we were that when I was coaching at Pick North, Pick Center, that was that was the rivalry, right? But then right. for you it was Reynoldsburg versus Pick, right? So it's changed over time. But my hometown, being back in Youngstown, Austintown, Fitch versus Boardman, that's always been the rival, and they still have the trophy. So that's interesting to see how some have faded away and some have stayed. Yeah, um, they. They haven't gave that trophy up in so long. But. It's awesome. Yeah, you need it. Like you, it's needed. And I think whether it's gone away or something, and rival like schedules change and conferences change. I, I think school. I think every kid should get to experience some type of a trophy game and get to compete for something symbolic. I, I, I really think that should happen everywhere. No, I agree. Stout, you got. Are you up next? I am, man, and I'm gonna flip it up. I've never been to Pittsburgh. People say it's a a great spot to be. Maybe one of these days I'm gonna get there. Talk to me, Coach. What's your favorite spot to eat on wine? What's your go to in Pittsburgh? Or what do you do? What do you get? What tell me? Yeah, so the coming from Columbus, when you enter the city, you're gonna go through a tunnel and. The view is breathtaking when you get through the other side of the tunnel and you're going to see the entire city open up. So you definitely got to make the trip, Kyle. It's only two and a half hours down the road. So come see us. And then there's a bunch of places to go. A couple of touristy things uh, give you an idea like what we're doing when we're hosting recruits. There's a place called Mount Washington that overlooks the entire city. There's restaurants and, and bars up there up on the hill that again overlook. You remember the old label for this the city that used to be Three Rivers mm. and then Hines and now it's Acrisure Stadium. But it really Three Rivers come together. The Allegheny Monongahela form the Ohio right there. And so it's a, a really hilly landscape too. Almost looks like pictures of, of Italy where houses are built on the sides of hills and it's random, but it's a cool kind of industrial town. And known for obviously the blue collar steel factories and the mills. Some of that's gone away and turned into some of the, the booming tech industry and, and all the other things that opportunities that are, are available in the city. So there's a bunch going on. You talk about some of my favorite places. It's tough coming from Columbus with edge to edge toppings on Donato pizza and roosters in town. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm debating some tough places here in Pittsburgh, but some of my favorites are just there's Permani brothers. Great tradition there. Talk about putting your sides right on the sandwich. I like the history of it. 
Uh, but to be honest, I don't. I like my sides on the side because I think the ratio mm-hmm. throws the salad, the sandwich off with too much, too much dryness with fries in there. Unless you're going to throw your ketchup in there as well. Uh, but I think that's a staple you have to at least experience. And so that I think that's certainly one place you have to hit. And then we live our our facility, I should say, is on what we call the South Side, right off Carson Street, uh, which has a bunch of, of, of different mom and pop restaurants, um, which is a cool place. Um, and one one of my favorite places is a soul food place called Carmi, which is a good place. And then I'm trying to give you see one more. Del Frisco's is a steakhouse downtown. It's probably my favorite in town. I've heard of that. I've heard there that name. I've heard yeah, of Del Frisco's. I have too. Yeah, so, I have. So I've, you, heard, I've obviously heard of Pimini Brothers and Del Frisco's. Yeah. So that, that's cool. I got to get there, man. I got to try to find a way to to finally see Pittsburgh. I've we never, take I've a never road been trip. There. Go see Coach Mayo and watch a practice. Let's do yeah. it. We should. I We've been throwing around this idea of a spring road trip, going and podcasting and, and checking out a few spring practices and stuff. Donovan's too busy with no kids. But we all find a way. Donnie's the only dude that's so busy with no yeah. kids. I've never seen yeah. anything like that. Busy man. Flying. Coach, so we'll move on to my next question. Here, Here's uh, one for you, and it comes up. I feel like a lot of times when we might talk to college coaches, but this one's one that I'm really interested in is if you look back at your time at Ohio Dominican, what's one thing that you would have told your younger self that you right now, what would you have told your younger self? It's a great question. Maybe just enjoy it. You know what I mean? I think as a younger coach, you're focused on trying to get somewhere. And again, I look back on it and uh, I have two young kids they are now eight and five. I'm trying to think Bailey. Um, she was only a couple of years old at the time. And, and we just had Lewis and the time with your kids. You, it sounds like two of you have them, right? It's precious. And so enjoying those moments, coaching ball and the, the, the experiences you have with guys like yourself, coach, those are great moments. And it's probably just enjoy it a little more. And that's something my dad tells me every day, slow down enjoy life and just like you guys as being extreme competitors and, and that's why you're in coaching you love the game and and the environment but also impacting people sometimes you lose sight of that and how blessed we are to be around the game to be around similar people and have the opportunity we do to impact young people it's interesting you say that because personally for me I was talking to my wife and that's like a big goal I have for myself in this next year is to try to get back more in the relationship side of things because i noticed when i was more of a position coach it it fosters that opportunity to be more relationship driven whereas as a coordinator as a head coach like you are so driven on winning games and personally for me in the last two years i've developed good relationship with kids but i would say my motive has has been winning right it has been driven to the pursuit of excellence and winning where I've lost my creativity and fun of developing the relationships and doing things. And so like I I told my wife, like that's something I'm seriously trying to do in this next year is try to balance that somehow, some way where yes, winning is important, but not forget that these are high school kids and they're here because they love football and and to try to give them an experience and do things outside of football with them. I don't want to say I lost myself, but it's almost like the last two years, it's been this complete pursuit of perfection as that's gone on. And I think unless you've been a head coach or unless you've been a coordinator, you don't know that balance or that challenge that presents to you. I'm glad you say that and to slow down. I I try to create as many opportunities as I can for my family to come around, like my daughter and my son and we work every Sunday with our kids and we're, we're getting a little bit habit of they come and they run around the field and see a little bit of practice. And then we go get lunch and go do things. And I think that's, that's important. So I I just think that's a key because I went through this year being nine and two and I felt more stressed out than I was when we were five and five, three and six. And I felt like I didn't get to enjoy it as much. And that's just an interesting yeah. point. Just like to enjoy the time with the kids that you have. Cause I was, I feel like I knew we were going to be a solid team this year. I knew we were going to be pretty good. And this was our first chance of being able to do something right and have a great record. And I was so thirsty for those wins. I was so hungry to just go get those wins yeah. that I lost a few things in that process that I want to get back to this year of just like having great relationships with the kids and, and really 
more or less just providing them those experiences because the memories are going to come no matter what the wins and losses are going to come. And I realized that like, it's no matter what. And I think as high school coaches, college, you don't deal with parents as much, but I think that the game of football in high school, you think that winning cures all. And I've said it before and it doesn't, it brings more problems, right? Cause every parent's going to be, they think their kids are the best and it's tough to navigate those things. But at the end of the day, I got to look back and step back and, enjoy it enjoy the time with those kids because you only get there for four years maybe a year two years three years whatever it may be but enjoy that time with that kid that you're helping build into a young man and like you said Kyle like I take my son every Saturday to film right he'll be back there growling making dinosaur noises and that's probably my favorite thing to watch is my my daughter my daughter we went to a brewery last week my daughter straight up form tackled a girl (laughs) <laughs> two, three years older than her, right on the turf. Like, we're at the <laughs> brewery, had a little turf, form tackled, laid her out. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Like, my my, my daughter just is always at football. She thinks it's okay to tackle people. But I think it's interesting. Dan Casey said this on one of his podcasts, and he said they won the state championship, and when they won, he felt sad because he realized that was the last opportunity with that team. And so I look at it, too. Like, I look at it like we were undefeated. 12 to 1, probably fell short of what we felt like we probably could have gone to. And that chase of perfection got me like, man, did I lose an opportunity to celebrate and build all the relationships I could have in that time frame? So that's my biggest thing of what I think we're all saying. And if you're a high school coach listening on here, it, it's hard to balance that trying to win and the relationship side of things. And that's a big goal for me heading this last year. And I'm going to be honest with you. I, I walked off when we, when we lost that regional semifinal game. I sat and Diamond might even watch me. I sat in the corner of the end zone for 15, 20 minutes, soaking it all up in. I thought I coached my last game, but I made a promise to Brennan that like I would make sure he would never see another coordinator and have to have a coaching change in his time and some other things. And I'm addicted to the game. I probably never quit it. I don't know that type of thing. So, I saw Coach Stout, but I was avoiding him because I didn't want to have to turn my letter of resignation in. But <laughs> I digress into my uh, – Coach, I got my second question for you. You can take it one either way you want to, but do you have a favorite place or atmosphere that you got to play in or coach in, if there was one that comes more to mind as a player or a coach? Any, anywhere that you've been across your time that you know, really sticks out? Yeah, I'd say my favorite of all time was the Packers Stadium, mm. playing there. Just the history. Lambeau Field, that's one of them for certain. Acrisure Stadium, Backyard Brawl this year. It'll be going down like it was two years ago at home. That's a fun environment. The Nippert, when I was saw us, when we were at Cincinnati, the transformation go from no one coming to being a Big East champion, a third sold-out stadium there. It was a nice environment. It's loud there. So, it's so, really loud. Again, just really, and blessed as a young coach, was went out to the Rose Bowl, beautiful environment down the cotton bowl as a ga you know there's so many and i think that's one of the the special things about uh the game is just the the environment on game day no matter where you're at and i think even the high school level too it's a, you're talking about the entire town coming to support the the football team and the opposing football team in that environment and i have so many great childhood memories running around the hills of the pickerington stadium playing football over in the grass and at every level. I just love that environment. So I think each one's unique. It's hard to say the best. I think I highlighted some that meant the most and had the most impact on me though. Yeah. I had a question loaded up about Ryan, but it's just too easy. And I think one of the cool things is, correct me if I'm wrong, but Pittsburgh and the Steelers still practice at the same facility, right? That's absolutely right. Okay. So I, I think that's a worthy thing to dive into Talk to us about what that looks like. Do you get to watch a lot of the Steelers practice? Is there a benefit of being there together? People know that happens, but like from the outside looking in, is there something unique or special about that? Absolutely. It's the only college place in the country paired with an NFL team like that. Our facility, uh, tell our guys and tell recruits the same thing. Like you, we do everything in the morning. So you are an NFL football player at Pitt. Just like the Steelers, you literally come in because we do everything in the morning. Our guys have class in the afternoon, which is an awesome setup. But like I said, we share 
the same building, although we don't share any rooms, like there's a wall and two different entrances, but we have the same executive chef that feeds the Steelers is, is feeding our guys. So we have great food. Unfortunately, I eat the food, so it's hard to lose weight. And uh, we share the practice fields out back. We share the indoor facility. We share resources and, and doctors and medical staff. And, and like you said, being able to watch them guys practice, they'll have OTAs coming up after the draft. So when our spring ball in, finishes and we get off the road recruiting, they're, do, they're doing rookie mini camps and uh, their OTAs, which is a great opportunity for us to go out and watch professional guys do it. And young guys, rookies trying to make it and cut their teeth. And then in the fall, it's a, it's a constant overlap. So it's not uncommon for Coach Tomlin to walk out and check our guys out and, and turn back and coach his guys. And same thing when we're walking off the field, guys are sitting on the bench and seeing guys do it at the highest level. And that's unbelievable motivation. It, it's As you guys know, just getting around, seeing other uh, as guys do it at the highest level is, is a way we can all learn. And so our, our young guys are able to watch position drills and see them compete is huge and see them be professionals the way they carry themselves and walk around and operate and so it's it's a huge advantage it's a pretty cool uh unique thing that happens at pittsburgh yeah i've always wanted to ask about it like i everybody knows this kind of a thing but it's just interesting to hear you dive into to the details of it so that's the pick six segment now we're going to get into finally picking this expert's brain finally get to the dark side of the moon baby donovan let's go Defensive time, man. I can't wait. It's about time Ryan finally got a good defensive coach on here. I know we've been offensive heavy. Oh, man, we'll just uh, say Coach Pratt wasn't a good defensive coach. He wasn't good. Who? You, Coach Pratt. He's great. It's, no, it's no, been no, a no, while. No, I just has been a good one. Ryan, don't sabotage the intro, Ryan, okay? <laughs> but, hey, Ryan just texted me. You got to go, Pete. Ryan, go, Pete. Go, Pete. About, We're going to excuse about. Ryan to go to the bathroom. It's been a while. I haven't Ryan's done usually, it I gotta go. Ryan hasn't done this in a while, but this was a classic from the beginning. Ryan's going to go to the bathroom. So, Coach, I'm going to get into this, and I think it's great. I love the offseason. I love this time through the winter, through the spring, where you're diving into all the concepts, and you're diving into who you're going to play, and you're thinking about your personnel and, and what you're going to look like in the next year. And that's why we thought about you could – kind of hop in and help people tell them right now what are some ways they could supercharge their defense in 2024 this is a flip side of the coin we did this on the offensive side of the ball with coach rodriguez from akron where he shared some strategies and things offensively Ex that's the fastest pee in the world ryan so I, just, i'm not gonna lie i just had to open the back door and just go out the back door so, i didn't know it's on we're super excited because I just, I, this is probably, this is maybe my, one of my most favorite windows of time of the season, the planning, the clinicking, the developing the plan of who you think you're going to be. And so coach, we're excited to have you on and, and dive into everything when to pick your brain and just turn it over to you. And I know we have some possible questions for you, but to throw it out there of, how others could maybe supercharge or be better defensively in 2024. Absolutely. I think it's a, a great topic and, and certainly something like you talked about. Everybody post as soon as the season's over, you're reflecting on things. How can we get better? You're researching different ways. But as I think about it, and we touched on this a little bit already, the number one thing is how do we get more information from us into them guys? And so it's relationships. I think that's the start. And, and I think there's really three angles of the relationship, right? It's coach to coach, right? And so it's, I think as a defensive staff of Pittsburgh, we spend a lot of time in a room together. We know how each other think and operate. We're able to challenge each other and force clarity. And so I think that coach to coach relationship is often overlooked. And I think when you have, that's a beautiful dynamic. Then you're talking about the coach to player relationship. And one thing we always say, the phrase, they don't care how much until they know how much you care. Getting to know not only what they do, but who they are as a person, how they operate, what's their why. Ask them about their parents, girlfriend, how school going, that type of stuff as much as you can and dive into their life. And then the other side is player to player, making sure that you provide an environment where those guys can do the same thing, invest time in getting to know each other and spend time together. I told my backers this offseason, when I was at Cincinnati, prior to us getting there, we had been told like Thursday night was the drinking night. 
and we wanted to change that. So we went out to dinner as a linebacker group on Thursday nights um, for camaraderie, but also to make sure no one's going out doing other things. And then Friday, you feel better. And Saturday, you play better. And, and so just finding ways to do things together to build those relationships is huge. And it takes time. It takes communication. It takes organization. I think Coach Nardi, Coach Narduzzi does a great job of it. We have mentor groups. So if you can picture chopping up your team's to different coaches. And for us, it's guys we didn't recruit or guys we don't coach. So I'm, I have a group of mentees that I don't normally see that I have an opportunity to interact with uh, guys that, that I'm not giving critical feedback to. So it's a different dialogue. You know what I mean? It's a different open conversation. And then we make, try to make the most of when guys are warming up in the off season or before practice, trying to touch as many people as you can, build those relationships, fostering it, but they take time and it takes communication to develop those things. But ultimately, I think you get confidence, right? When you know how people operate and who they are as a person, you have confidence in each other around you. You're motivated to work for those people, to work with those people, and it gives everybody a stronger purpose. So I think cultivating those relationships and working at them every day is critical. And that's the number one thing I think overall. Again, I'm a big believer in that. Um, number two is a, is a vision. So you talk about uh, Coach, I was gonna, hold on, Wes, I was yeah. going to ask you a question about something you said there. You were talking about knowing the players and their things they're going through, and I imagine that's mentally things that they've went through. What are some things that Pitt has in place for, like, the mental health of players since that's become such a big thing in today's game? Yeah, we just had a speaker today. So constantly, I think number one is informing people that th these are issues that come up, addiction, gambling problems, whatever it may be, sexual harassment, informing them of the different issues that could affect their health for common problems that come up for student athletes, informing them, having speakers talk about it, and then sharing the resources available to help them. But again, it gets back to, I think, if they know you and trust you, they're willing to come talk to you. And then again, as administrators were able to help give them the resources and, and help point them in the right direction. Uh, but we, we do a good job. Again, I think it's education, uh, but it's also caring. Every person in the building should view themselves as, as a leader and a, somebody who, who's a steward of the program and wants to help everybody. And so we have the resources in place and we have the, the pathways because of those relationships. No, that's good. That, thank you, Coach. You got on to your second one then. Yeah, number two, I think, is a vision. And, and um, you think you get in, like Coach Stout, you're talking about the clinic mode where there's a lot of great ideas out there, a lot of different ways to play defense, a lot of way, different ways to play offense, special teams, a lot of different ways to have culture, all those different facets. But ultimately, whatever group you're leading, you have a, a big picture culture, your team, you have a micro culture for your unit, your position room, there has to be an overlying vision. So I think Coach Bates, our defensive coordinator, does a great job simplifying that. We want to be at Pitt, the most aggressive defense in the country. And for us, he has one word that we break defenses on. He has a, a visual of that. And he has something you can picture. And it's the word, damn. You know what I mean? He wants every viewer, as you watch Pitt defense on TV, to think, damn, look how fast they are. Look how aggressive they are. And look how they play. You know what I mean? So our guys break damn on three. And, and again, it's one word, but it's really something that you can apply to everything we do defensively and it sounds silly that we our, our culture is a program's attitude effort toughness knowledge right and a lot of people have different pillars but we want to be the most aggressive versions of each of those have great attitude be a you know relentless effort be extremely tough attack knowledge you know what i mean all those things as aggressive as we can and then we're the same way schematically right we pressure with six more than anybody in the country we press our corners and put them on islands every single play like every, our d line gets off the ball vertical like we are as aggressive schematically technique and tactics and the results we're chasing are aggressive results so again all of those things make it easy for us as position coaches to evaluate the techniques we're teaching, the scheme, and also the results we want. And, and I think all of that vision gives alignment of expectations. And, and there's clarity of what he's looking for and what we want to be. And so I think as coordinator, Coach Bates does a great job. And again, I think that's something that can supercharge. You talk about, I think that's huge, right? You have the relationships and then you're pointing them in the direction you want with that vision. Here's who 
we are. This is what we want to be and selling that. And again, it's also something that's exciting for a young man to want to be, right? You want to be aggressive. So whatever that vision is, you certainly don't want to be the most passive team in the country, whatever that may be. But you want to give them an exciting vision that everybody can grasp. It's simple. Like I said, we can reduce it to one word. And so, again, I think that's a great thing that can supercharge you, reduce it and simplify it, but also make it exciting. Coach, I got a question for you. You talk about vision and, and the culture overall, at least at, at Pitt. Do you think, because I, maybe it's different for high school or different colleges you go to, but do you think it's harder in the long run to say, okay, our core culture is, or, or vision is going to be X and we're going to implement that no matter who comes in recruiting class wise or, or sophomores coming to high school program. Do you think that's harder? Or do you think it's harder to constantly change our mission this year is this or our vision this year is that? Because I think there's two different alleyways to do it, right? Some people like the standardized, we do this at our program or what others like, no, you play it by what's your team like, what's your goals like, so on and so forth. I think that's a great question. And I do think it's a little bit different if you can recruit, obviously, schematically. So that vision of defense, I think, can stand for us because we recruit to it. I think as a program, your culture has to be based, on, based more on um, pillars that are more things that stand the test of time. Like I said, the attitude, effort, toughness, knowledge. But I think maybe high school, you do have to change that to your team, whether you're smash mouth one year or your air, you know, speed, whatever it may be based on your personnel. I don't know, but I, I get what you're saying. And I think whatever it is though, you, you certainly want to tell them what you think and that buy-in is critical. Yeah. I think that's the unique thing about high school football, right? We get what we get and you have to be able to adjust every year. Cause every year I've been here for four years now at Northland and Every year has been a completely different team, at, not as scheme wise, but just as the relationship wise, who our leaders are, what type of leaders we have, who we're leaning on, who we're looking to. Right. There's so many things that change so much every year to year in high school, especially even leaving from Pick North to go to the city. Right. Completely different environments and just different ways to coach. I'm with you. Coach, what's, what's, what's number three? Number three, I think, is fundamentals. Again, you get back to it. And, and like you said, you, you self-scout yourself after the year, watch all your plays, and, and you're reduced when you take away the scheme to fundamentals. And, and for us defensively, I think, and I think anywhere defensively, that's pursuit, getting to the football, block defeat, and tackling. And, and every position is a little bit different in how your pursuit, how you start in a stance – and get out of your stance and efficiently get to the ball, right? And every position hey, is a little bit different. Drill. Started every day with pursuit drill to hide the minute with Coach <laughs> Manilak. Never failed pursuit every single day. You got to fly around, man. You got to fly around. You got to take great angles and then block the feet. Like I said, you got to be able to get off blocks and you got to be able to tackle. And I think you talk about each position knowing – reducing down what you do the most watching you could if i'm looking at the linebackers over 900 plays of the season three positions what are those specific movements they're doing right we're getting an efficient stance we're shuffling laterally we're running downhill at an angle uh, we might back pedal we might open up at a 45 hurt pass drop we've got to get out of a you know a stagger stance or a square stance and so those are the things right that's being a linebacker so we've got to master those an individual and make sure we can be as efficient as possible. And then block the feet, whether you're a believer of ripping or arm overing or shocking and being maybe you have two gap, whatever it is, but mastering that craft and being able to break that down into simple components for your guys to grasp and be able to develop them is huge. And then tackling, whatever form of tackling you believe, I think everybody should be on the same page from front to back and be able to know what it looks like and how you're evaluating it and make sure you're doing it. And I think it gives the players something. I think all good players want to master their craft. And I think when you know what the fundamentals are, you're trying to get better at, you take pride in becoming better at each one. And, and so those are things that I think are critical. And I think that transforms the talent you have as a ball team to skill so that you can execute the scheme you want to get done. And I think that's why those fundamentals are so important. It's interesting you say that because like, a big thing we just talked about last month, like when our staff meeting was musts. So it was communicating and so I rewind that back, developing the musts in your unit. So offensive line, D line, linebacker, whatever it is, whatever your unit is, what is the must that they must be able to do? 
and then marrying your drills to that. And so the big pursuit we've had is creating these sets of musts and communicating them to the kids and then also making sure that ties up with our drills to have this complete alignment. And I know on the offensive side of the ball, we've been making images up. And so we literally have for almost every unit, like the must in that unit, what must you be able to do to play it this in this unit and succeed? And, you know, that ties to our scheme that ties to the position that ties to everything. And it's interesting because that's been the big alignment pursuit we've been on right now. Coach, you talk about tackling. Obviously, I'm defensive guy. I love tackling. That, that's a key. But your guys' season's obviously pretty long. Um, and the question I got is, how do you guys implement full speed tackling, trying to save your guys, right, week in to week out to make sure they're not getting dinged up on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever it looks like. How much are you guys really tackling full go? if you guys are at all, because I know some schools don't even tackle full go with their own guys, but how are you practicing those things? Uh, so spring ball right now, we take full advantage on, I think they have NCAA limits. I don't even know what the exact limits are, but I know we max them out for tackling. Yeah. Whatever we're allowed to do full, we do live, which I know is a, on the <laughs> side. Again, fits with what we want to be. So we're going to tackle. When we get to the season, like you said, in, in terms of reducing injuries, we don't go live during the season. But we on the bye weeks, we did. We got a little bit extra recovery there. We did go live. So uh, we were a three-day practice, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday during the season. We try to thud on Tuesday and Wednesday and then we'll tag off on Thursdays. Yeah. Now, I, I do believe thudding is one of the hardest things to do in football. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Obviously, the more athletic your guys are, the better chance you have of them thudding. But as that angle increases, it, it's hard. You're either going to – uh, have to tag or you're going to end up taking the guy to the ground. So safety's compromised. It's a, are you, you're teaching your guys to stop their feet and grab it is the thing I hate, right? You want them to continue to get in a good football position, accelerate their feet and try to remain on their feet. And so that's how we do it. It's always like something that I, I try to adjust our practices on. Like I remember my first year as a head coach, I'm like, fuck, we're tackling every single day. Forget it. We're going full go no matter what. And we've really geared it down now as I'm in my fourth year as a head coach, just realizing the injuries. But that's something I'm always trying to adjust is how much we're tackling because I don't want them to get in those bad habits of just reaching for a guy or not bringing their feet or not getting their head in the right position when they're going to tackle a guy because I've seen that too. That's also another reason why I hate seven on seven because I've seen it from an offensive perspective, just how bad it can get, right? Like the guys, no guys just run by or they don't do anything or they arm tackle. Like it is a really big battle. I see it from the other side when I just sit there and watch the defensive practice and and stuff. So I, I, I recognize that and see that. Absolutely. Coach number four, we got for us blitz. Encourage to supercharge your defense blitz. And and what is that to me? You're adding a second, third level guy to the front. And and schematically, you you can get creative. Anyone who's close enough to get to the box, we we blitz everybody but our field safety and field corner. We're getting guys involved. We're bringing guys. And I think it's fun to do. I've never met a player who doesn't want to blitz. Some of them fake the funk a little bit. They don't really want to go in the noise, but everybody thinks they want to, but it is fun to do. And then I think schematically element of surprise have stood the test of time for battles and war forever, right? And so you're changing numbers, you're changing angles and leverage, and you're manipulating the play duration, which I think is huge. And I think offenses control when that ball was snapped. Uh, But I think if you bring six people, which we do, and sometimes seven with peel responsibilities, you're going to force an offense to have a little bit different answers than if you drop eight. Now, if you do everything in between, now you challenge an offense to really have only a couple different answers that fit for everything. And so I really love the ability to to bring different numbers of guys and change that play duration and make them have answers as quarterbacks, put them in that pressure and also make that offensive coordinator prepare a little bit differently um, when they're going to play a team that blitzes like we do. And again, go back to training and aligning everything. We also train blitzing, right? And and our guys do a good job of getting knee over toe, creating that shin angle and no false steps. And that's something they take pride in is making plays behind the line of scrimmage. And as that's huge. And so I think that's a huge thing to supercharge your defense. 
Take the funk. That's Tawan Gordon, right? <laughs> my, my roommate in college. That's my guy. He was one of our corners, our DBs. He always acted like he wanted to hit, but he was scared to. Uh, hey, let's let Coach. Tawan. I'm going to make him listen to this. Let's let Coach do number five, and then we'll rattle off whatever we have for him. Yep. And then number five takeaways. Taking the ball away is so huge. And I think it's something every defensive staff's looking to do. Finding a way to get more fumbles and more interceptions. Techniques of the best way to force them best way to recover them. I'll give you one small thing we saw in, in film study last year. We're looking at fumbles that are on the ground, what we would call a city fumble, where there's guys around and you need to recover in the fetal position. We had guys that were going right to the football and guys were essentially getting boxed out. And so a simple drill we implemented was a competitive city fumble drill, where instead of going right to the football, when you felt the pressure coming from another guy, diving for the football, you're going to knock him out of the way with your shoulder and create the space to recover the ball. But I think truly observing those opportunities um, that you're missing can create more opportunities. And I think you have to find a way to do that. And we were able to get more of those this year, finding opportunities to do that. And as takeaways change the game, stealing possession, stealing time on the clock, um, demoralizing an offense's rhythm, and so those are huge. And I think you just can't get enough of making that important. Coach Bates, again, our coordinator does a good job celebrating that. We have the, the hoop on the sideline, which is good training. A lot of places you go, you, you get an interception in practice and the whole team runs on the field like crazy people, right? We, we try to teach them even in practice that stay on the sideline and everybody get around the hoop and the guy who made the play come dunk it, which eliminates some of that extracurricular personal foul stuff. But again, our guys take pride in it, right? They want to make that dunk. And we're showing highlights of dunk contests in the unit meeting to get guys fired up and then showing their dunks to just have fun with it. But encouraging takeaways, rewarding it, and finding the best ways to do it. I love it because, like, on the flip side, like, we broke down every way we turned over the ball or fumbled the ball, I should say. Like, it picks a pick. But we looked at every way the ball is stripped or fumbled in – that was the pursuit the next year was we try to replicate those drills in all of our ball security situations. How can we put those kids back in those situations to try to take care of the ball? It's interesting to hear from the defense perspective. I'm not going to leave this show without challenging a defensive guy. Like it's just me being selfish. I do this to every defensive guy, <laughs> but what are maybe the schemes or what are the things challenging you the most on the defensive side of the ball right now? What is Pitt or what are you guys really focused on in 2024? The things that I think we focus on um, are the, just the trends we see. And we look at all our games last year and identify where we have things that are RPOs. I think everybody's got answers for those now. So what are the new trends? And I think some one of the invoke things in the NFL is the Tyreek Hill fast motions. So just making, I think that's, we're making sure we're up to speed with being able to handle that and make the different adjustments necessary there. You're seeing more of the heavy double teams in the, the run game from the duo scheme rather than the true zones. So different ways to challenge that. And then, just, like I said, it, it's, I don't know that it's anything crazy. It never really is, but just making sure we're able to expose our guys to all of those situations, think through them. And when we get to summer scout after spring ball, we're looking at, um, you know, re-looking at each opponent and some of the things they presented and having a preliminary game plan going into the season of answers we think could help us. And when we get to those game week time for preparing, we already have some initial thoughts that we took time in the summer to dive through. As schemes ebb and flow and there's who has the pen last, it has the advantage. And so uh, just having a plan, but also having the, your next punch ready when they make their, their counter punch. Coach, I got one more last question for you, or I can, we could be on here all night with me. But what I would say, I got a question with, we always talk about our goal boards for defense, right? Offense, defensive goal boards, special teams, goal boards that are posted in our locker room. What's one goal that you've seen besides takeaways, right? Because if you win the turnover battle, that's pretty much going to make sure that you get that win column goal in there. In my experience, if we win the turnover, we win the turnover battle, we pretty much always get the win. Hmm. What's another goal that you guys have on your board that you see, okay, we hit this goal. We usually 90 to hundred percent of the time we win this football game. Yeah, we're a big believer in rushing defense. And I think it's a, because it factors in sacks, it's a line of scrimmage measurement. It's something that says you won up front, and I think it's huge. And obviously, you have to be able to limit the explosive. But I think when you can stop the run, 
and you can sack the quarterback. You're getting guys behind the chains. It gives you a, in position to have more success on third and fourth downs and gives you a chance to, to keep teams out of the end zone and force field goals. So it helps line up a lot of your other goals when you can win the line of scrimmage. And, and that rushing defensive uh, stat is a big indicator of that. Demoralizing for the other side of the ball. Honestly, like it's demoralizing if you just consistently lose the battle in the trenches. It's we've created the image the last three years. We've talked about our mountain, which we're switching up into this year, but we've talked about the three things or the three base camps at the top of that mountain were when the rushing battles the team, explosive plays, and then winning the turnover margin. And we made them team wide goals. So we have personnel packages where defensive kids come and play on the offensive side of the ball. And it's pretty much narrowed down to when we win those three or win two out of those three, we win. And and we've dived into statistics even more year in and year out. And it's interesting to dive into some of the different studies they've done on college football where like coach talked about winning rushing battle. Like it was something like if you could rush for more than one yard than your opponent, you had like 70, 80% more chance of winning the ball game. Because like he said, it, it's tied into staying ahead of the chains or putting the offense into longer situations and, and that type of thing. And like I, I sent our offensive chat, I've been diving into situational football a ton this off season and trying to remanage our expectations in practice. Winning on third and long offensively might be 25, 30%. Like we're beating our heads in the wall in practice, like when we don't convert every one. But let's like realistically, when you look at NFL college high school, if you can win like over 30 percent of third and seven, eight plus, like you're probably OK. Like um, I love those goals and they've been with me for six, seven, eight years now. And the win the rushing battle to me, if you were going to focus on anything that could make your team tough and all bought in together. That's the perfect one. I love it. I'm with you. There we go. Donnie, you want to wrap this thing up? Wrap it up. Coach, we appreciate you coming on. really do. Hopefully, the rest of your spring ball goes well as you guys head into the summer and, and gearing up for another successful season. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you follow us on Twitter at 614 Headsets. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube. And make sure you follow us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts or audiobooks, you can find us on there. But, Coach, again, we want to thank you for coming on for another great episode. Make sure you follow us all on Twitter. You can see our Twitter names on there. Coach Stout, thank you for getting that all lined up as you usually do. Appreciate uh, it. Make sure, you call, make sure you follow Coach, too, man. Coach mm-hmm. Manilak, probably an up and, a rising star, up and comer, as you can hear him talk and everything he did. He did a phenomenal job on here. Follow Coach. Go to the home, 614SS.com. If you're still listening, I'm speaking this weekend at the West Jeff Clinic. Can't wait to finally talk about the trenches and get away Mm -hmm. from the sugar butts, the receivers who I'm (laughs) stuck with all the time. So, Coach, appreciate you, man. And if I can make the Pittsburgh, I'm going to hit you up. Sounds good. Appreciate you guys. It was an honor to speak. And like I said, love the show. Love what you guys are doing. Keep it up. We appreciate you. You're the man. As always, they don't score, they don't win. That's That was Manilax there when we were at ODU. Do you still say that? That's right. Absolutely. They don't score, we don't win. Or we yeah. win. There you go. Yeah, they don't score, they don't win. That was <laughs> Manilax there. He told us that a couple of times. We appreciate nice. you, Coach. Appreciate you guys. Have a good night.